Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Cruising your way on this episode of Off 90. Teacher, writer, and state representative learn the story of a man from central Minnesota whose interest in the state spans from its conception to its future. We take a trip to Rochester and meet a couple with a very unique collection, toasters. We explore the interesting history behind this important kitchen appliance that we might take for granted. Like father, like daughter, meet a blues singer from Austin who learned to sing the blues from her father and listen to what they sound like when they play the blues together. It's all just ahead, off 90. Hi, I'm Barbara Keith. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Off 90. Dean Erdahl was raised in a region of Minnesota rich with historical significance. He grew up close to the epicenter of the Dakota War of 1862, a war that claimed many lives on both sides of the conflict and culminated with the largest mass execution in U.S. history. Dean was fascinated by the tales of his ancestors, which led to a career in teaching history. Eventually, Dean wrote and published books about the Dakota War, along with other books regarding the history of Minnesota. I think that uh, it's a lot easier to, to write about what you know about. Uh, I can write about Minnesota because uh, the area that I'm writing is right here, right where I live. I'm Dean Erdahl, and I'm a writer. Uh, I wrote um, touching bases with our memories about the Minnesota Twins. I interviewed 50 form, former Twins ball players, and then lives lived large, uh, dealing with famous living Minnesotans. Uh, those were, were the first books that uh, I wrote, and they were published in 2001. Now, mainly I write historical fiction, and particularly about the U.S. Dakota War of 1862. I've written a series, Uprising, which tells the story of the war, a Retribution, which is about the captives, trials, and executions following the war, Pursuit, which deals with uh, uh, Generals uh, Sibley and Sully going into the Dakota Territory in 1863 uh, in search of Little Crow and other Dakota people, and the final book, which wraps up the uh, a war at Kildare Mountain in North Dakota and then delves into the assassination of Abraham Lincoln is called Conspiracy. I have another book uh, that I wrote on uh, Father John Kaiser, a Minnesota priest who was murdered in Kenya, uh, also uh, a historical fiction book. In my writing, uh, the differences between historical fiction and straight history writing uh, are mainly how I tell my story. I use dialogue in large measure to tell the story, and uh, that's not done in, in usually in straight history writing. And so I do my research. Uh, I try to get the events uh, accurately depicted. I use mostly actual historical characters in my books. But uh, I do use some dialogue, in fact, quite a bit of dialogue, and uh, there are some characters that didn't really exist in history or maybe existed, and uh, I think those are the main differences. But my history is, is, I think, pretty accurate. I have done a lot of research. I certainly think that Minnesota history is important for people to learn about. Uh, I want them to know about what happened in Minnesota in 1862. And if they read my series of books, uh, they'll have a real good idea of what did happen here. This war was a defining moment in Minnesota history when on August 17th, four young men 
returning after a failed hunting trip, very disillusioned because the uh, terms of the treaty guaranteeing them food, money, and uh, different goods had not been kept. And in frustration, they killed five white people. They went to Little Crow's Village, Red uh, Middle Voices Village of the Rice Creek Band as well. And from there, uh, told what they had done. The Dakota people, the leaders then went to Little Crow, uh, said that we need you to lead us in war because these four have killed and war is inevitable now. And so Little Crow did. Uh, 250 people died that day in the Minnesota River Valley, most of them immigrant women and children, some men. From that beginning day of August 18th, the Minnesota River Valley was in flames. The settlements burned, people dying, between six and 800. We don't know how many Indians died, maybe 50, maybe 100. Uh, certainly the aftermath of the war was much harder on the Indian people. But we have battles at Fort Ridgely and Birch Coulee and Hutchinson and Forest City Acton, New Ulm was attacked. And finally, the war culminates at Wood Lake when Little Crow loses his final battle there to General Sibley. And uh, then we have the trials that ha happen afterward, uh, the 38 sentence to die after uh, Abraham Lincoln reprieves the death sentences of 265. Uh, the Indian Re Removal Act then moving the uh, remaining Dakota into the Dakota Territory to Crow Creek, which is near present-day Chamberlain, South Dakota. But importantly, the aftermath is still with us today. There are still hard feelings, uh, not just on the side of the Dakota people who were removed, who had their annuities taken from them, their money taken from them, their land. Uh, certainly, uh, they still have hard feelings, but the people of New Ulm, people in, who are the descendants of those who died in the Minnesota River Valley also. Uh, the purpose of my writing is to encourage education because I believe that through education can come understanding and through understanding can come healing and healing is still needed today in the state of Minnesota. So I've had this interest uh, all my life about history and historical events. I don't know what exactly spawned that interest. It, it could have been my family background. My family came to uh, Meeker County, Litchfield Township in 1856. They were the uh, first family that came to, to what is now Litchfield Township. Uh, Ole Halverson Ness, my great-great-grandfather, was part of the burial party uh, that brought the five who were killed to the Ness Cemetery and, and buried them there. I went to Ness Church as a, as a boy, and so I, I'm sure that I came out of church and I'm, I'm sure I saw the, the large stone monument next to the church and I'm asking about it. And my mother is starting to tell me stories about the family history and the history of the area. And I, I think that that maybe stimulated my interest in history at a, at a very young age. Well, I graduated from uh, Litchfield High School and then attended uh, St. Cloud State uh, University. Uh, graduated uh, from St. Cloud State in 1971. Got a job teaching at New London Spicer High School and I was there for 35 years. I've had an interest in being a state legislator for a long time. Uh, I thought that uh, there were things that I could offer that, 
that would be of good service to the people. I, I wanted to serve the people of my district. There have been uh, ways in which my legislative career and my education career and my interests all kind of come together, including my writing. There, I, I'm a storyteller at heart, and storytellers sometimes write stories. The difference between people that write books and start writing books are those that write them, finish them. And so uh, I began to write, and you know, the rest, I guess, is history. I've continued to write. Every morning, you might brew a cup of coffee and toast some bread for breakfast before you go to work. But have you ever stopped to consider how such a seemingly simple device like your toaster came to be? Maynard and Marlis Jones could tell you. They're the owners of a unique and rare collection of toasters. And if you have any intention of keeping up with the Joneses, bear in mind that they have over a thousand of them. One thing you never know about these old toasters is that one will burn it right away and the other one just takes a few more minutes to burn it. <laughs> I'm Maynard Jones and this is my wife Marlis and we collect toasters. This toaster is what got me started in collecting to uh, toasters. It's, uh, I went to an auction sale and they held it up, the auctioneer did, and he thought it was a toaster and I bought it for $18. Well, the Rochester Post Bulletin had an article in the paper telling how rare it was and it was worth $525. And it's one of the toasters that all collectors really like because you uh, bring it out, put the bread in there and let it go back. When that side's toasted, then you flip it around to the other side and then both sides work the same way. Oh, it didn't take me long to get serious. In our collection, we have a little over 1,100 different toasters. One time, my wife was gone someplace in town anyway. I was going to make myself a sandwich, and I thought I'd get the toaster out and have some toast. Well, she changed where it always was, and I couldn't find it, so I just forgot about it, and I never even thought I had over a thousand toasters out in the <laughs> toaster shed, so I didn't have toast. <laughs> This is the first American electric toaster, General Electric, 1909. And it was the first toaster device that done bread only. And on top of the early toasters, they had what you call toast racks. And if you made your toast, you set them up there to keep them warm while you made more toast. The first pop-up toaster was made in 1926 was made by a Minneapolis company called Waters Genter. We know the, uh, the son of, of Mr. Waters. He held this up and said, this sent me through college. Today, the pop-up is basic only toaster really made. So it's uh, not much fun collecting the newer ones. So that's why I cut off about 1950. When they first started uh, manufacturing toasters, the uh, General Electric 1909 was just wires and it was a percher. You just set your toast in a little basket and the uh, element heated it and then you had to turn it. Then they started making doors and so they called them floppers. This is the, the, one of the first four place toasters. You uh, put the bread in there, one side's done, then you turn it to the other side. We do go all over the country looking for toasters. In fact, when we travel, we never stop to look at Mount Rushmore or things like that, but if it says antiques, we stop. We collect anything that has something to do with toast. 
after you got started, I seen how many different toasters there were made a long time ago. I, then I really got interested. And so I built a building. I'm a retired carpenter and uh, I'd have to uh, do remodeling on houses and I'd bring what we're supposed to throw away. So I'd bring it home and I'd build uh, this building that we're sitting in now from uh, recycled lumber. We belong to the Toaster Collectors Association and that's a group of people from all over the United States, Canada, and we even have some members from Germany. We learned about the group through a friend of ours, so we went to the first convention in 1998 and have been going ever since. From sunup till sundown at the convention, we talk about toasters. It's hard to find good toasters. If I don't have it, I'll buy it, but then if I find one better, I'll get that one. That's why I have about 300 duplicates. So if anybody wants toasters, I have some. <laughs> I don't need toast. <laughs> Cena Earhart was born and raised in the House of Blues. Through years of playing music in clubs and juke joints, her guitarist father, Ed Earhart, laid the groundwork for a love of blues that eventually led to the formation of the Cena Earhart Band. Sina has taken those influences and several years of experience to forge her own personal and intelligent take on the blues. We sat down with Sina and Ed to talk a little bit about their music and to hear a little blues too. I can remember Sina running around the house when she was six or seven years old and I'd have Billie Holiday playing and she'd be singing with it spot on and I'm like, here we go. <laughs> and he constantly practiced and always had a guitar in hand and I was always singing along and even in the car on the way to school. The name of this song is Baby Valentine. <laughs> Mama called me this morning awake from the night before Police came and knocking Nearly knocked down her front door As she ran down the stairs She wondered if this would be her last time The last time that she'd see Her sweet baby Valentine Think I wouldn't notice In the liquor cabinet Baby brother there's a water where our whiskey should have been You think I wouldn't see When I looked in your eyes The brother I knew, he wasn't you You're wearing a disguise Baby Valentine Baby Valentine Oh, please start doing right Baby Valentine Asleep tonight. 
I sang all the time, just around the house. I wasn't really in choir or any kind of organized singing activities, but definitely loved music and always was singing and entertaining. And I grew up in a home filled with music because my dad has always played professionally in different bands. And I would sit on the bottom of the basement stairs and watch the band practices and tag along and carry guitars to gigs and things like that. And so when I got to be old enough to join up with his band, I begged and begged to do that. And he said I had to finish college first before that would be an option. And so within a few days of graduating with my bachelor's degree, I joined up with his band. The way we write is, is sort of an all of the above kind of deal. I'll write some of the music, Sina will write some of the music, I write some of the lyrics, she writes some of the lyrics, and sometimes we collaborate on a tune. It just depends, and, and we'll constantly float ideas by each other, and some stick and some don't. I mean, there's a million things going on in our heads, and, and so we try not to get too um, hung up on any one thing. Blues is a real, it's sort of a symbiotic relationship. It's, it's a two-way deal. If it, when the audience is into it, the band feeds off that. I mean, that's true in any music to a certain extent, but boy, it sure seems especially so in blues. It's a very visceral, emotional genre. It, it's gotten to the point for me that I, I don't think like Cena's dad anymore when we're on stage, because Cena's become a pro. She's worked hard at it, and so I, I think of her more as a, prof a professional singer, and I don't really think in the dad mode anymore. It's the band and making music. As soon as we're done, I'm back to dad. But, <laughs> and that'll never stop. I mean, anybody who's a dad knows that. When people ask me what it's like to have my dad in the band, I always say that it's just a true blessing for me. The name of this song is Dreamin' or Dyin'. I can't hold you in my arms And your love won't keep me safe from any harm Still I chase you But you run from me I think maybe i 
even when I dream even if they pass me by Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.